Good morning and welcome to our worship assembly here at the Brown Trail Church of Christ. We're glad that you're here today. If you are among our guests, uh, we give to you a very special welcome. Thank you for joining us today. If you're joining us online, we're grateful for that as well. I know a number of our members are still uh, worshiping with us uh, through that medium and uh, others in other locations are doing so as well. Uh, we are grateful that you are a part of our uh, worship today. And as we begin uh, to uh, focus our minds and, and engage our hearts uh, in our worship today, I wanted to bring uh, before you a brief reading from the Psalms, Psalm 112. Praise the Lord. Blessed is the man who fears the Lord, who greatly delights in his commandments. His offspring will be mighty in the land. <clears throat> the generation of the upright will be blessed. Wealth and riches are in his house, and his righteousness endures forever. David Hamrick will be directing our singing this morning, so let's enter into our worship heartily. Good morning. If you would please uh, join me in standing for the first two of these songs. We shall assemble on the mountain, we shall assemble at the throne, bring humble hearts into his presence, we bring an offering of song, glory and honor and dominion,
together. Heavenly Father, we come to you now and thank you for this wonderful day where we can come together and worship your holy and precious name. We thank you for the rain we are experiencing right now. We ask that you help those um, that have been affected so negatively by the hurricane that's hit part of South Texas and, and Louisiana. We ask for you to heal the division in our country and make us united again. We ask for you to cure the land, our land, of the virus that has affected so many, and we have faith that you will. We ask that you be with those who have just recently gone off to school, and we ask that you keep them safe and healthy, both physically and spiritually. We ask that you help us to worship this morning in spirit and in truth, and we ask that our worship is uh, pleasing unto your name. We thank you so much for your son Jesus and what he did when he came to earth and died on the cross for our sins. It's his name we pray. Amen. Before the Lord's Supper, we'll sing on Calvary's cross. If you have difficulty reading that, that is number nine in the supplement.
As we prepare to partake in the Lord's Supper this morning, I'll be reading from the book of Matthew, chapter 27, verses 22 through 26. I'll be reading down the English Standard Version. Matthew 27, 22 through 26. Pilate said to them, Then what shall I do with Jesus, who is called Christ? And they said, Let him be crucified. And he said, Why? What evil has he done? But they shouted all the more, Let him be crucified. So when Pilate saw that he was gaining nothing, but rather that as a riot was beginning, he took water and washed his hands before the crowd, saying, I am innocent of this man's blood. See to it yourselves. And all the people answered, His blood be on us and on our children. And then he released for them Barabbas, and having scourged Jesus, delivered him to be crucified. Let's pray for the bread. Dear Father in heaven, as we gather here this morning, and we prepare ourselves to partake of the bread, we remember Jesus coming. That great sacrifice he laid down his life for us. We pray, dear Father, as we compare ourselves to that example, that we not be like Pilate, who knew what he was doing was wrong, but yet went along with the crowds. We pray, dear Father, that we will not be allowing ourselves to be molded by society and the will of what seems to be the masses, but we always stand up for what is right and for what is true. We pray, dear Father, that as we see error creeping into our lives, we might correct that. So we might be more pure. We just pray to our Father that we partake this bread. We might remember that sacrifice Jesus made for us. Pray us in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you for joining us today on the webcast of our worship assembly. If you're unfamiliar with worship assemblies and churches of Christ, allow me to explain what we're doing. On the night that Jesus was betrayed by Judas and turned over to his enemies to be crucified, the Lord gathered with his apostles to observe the Jewish Passover. At that gathering, he inaugurated a new practice to be observed in the church after his resurrection and ascension back to heaven. This memorial involves eating and drinking items that symbolize his body and blood. Listen to Matthew's account of this event. While they were eating, Jesus took some bread, and after a blessing, he broke it and gave it to the disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body. And when he had taken a cup and given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you, for this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. Matthew 26, verses 26 through 28. Then in the next verse, Matthew 26, 29, Jesus informed the disciples that they would not observe this memorial again until the kingdom was established. And when the kingdom, also called the church, came into existence, the disciples began to observe this memorial regularly. Acts 2, 42. How regularly? Acts 20, verse 7 reveals that on the first day of the week. It's our desire to follow the example of the New Testament church in all essential matters. That's why we do as they did and observe this memorial to Jesus every first day of the week. Will you pray with me? Our Father in heaven, we are so grateful for this opportunity that we have each week to come together and to worship you and to remember the great sacrifice that your son made. Lord, we know that our sins have incurred a debt that we can never pay. And as we partake of this fruit of the vine, we remember the blood that your son shed to pay the price of our sins. Lord, help us each day to be mindful of Jesus' great sacrifice. We pray that it will strengthen our faith and help us in the face of temptation to overcome it. We pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. According to the New Testament, the weekly observance of the Lord's Supper involves more than remembering Jesus and the sacrifice that he made for us. 
though that is the primary emphasis. The Lord's Supper also affords time for personal examination. Listen to Paul and his inspired teaching to the church in Corinth. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Therefore, whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner shall be guilty of the body and the blood of the Lord. But a man must examine himself, and in so doing he is to eat of the bread and drink of the cup. 1 Corinthians 11, verses 26 through 28. As the church continues this memorial observance today, we're not only thinking about what Jesus did for us on the cross, we're also thinking about ourselves. We're looking deep within our hearts and examining our actions to see if our lives have been a proper reflection of our gratitude for what Jesus did for us. So this is a valuable time each week for the Christian. We gratefully remember Jesus and we humbly examine ourselves. Separate and apart from the Lord's Supper, following the example set forth by the apostles, we take the opportunity to give back to the Lord as we have prospered. The elders have given us several different ways to contribute. One of them is the passing the plates at this time. If you would like to contribute this way, uh, please raise your hand and make it known, and one of the ushers will, will come to you following the prayer. Let us pray. Dear Father in heaven, we're so very thankful for the many things you've done for us and the way you watch over us and take care of us. You've blessed each and every one of us ways beyond that we can imagine. We're so thankful for all that you do for us, even though we are not worthy of any of it. We pray, dear Father, as we give back this morning, we pray that we'll give cheerfully. We pray, dear Father, that the funds that are collected be used to further the kingdom, not only in this community, but also throughout the Metroplex, throughout the this country and throughout this world. There's so many in need and we pray dear Father that you will bless our efforts as we try to reach out to those that are lost and bring the good news to them. We pray also in Jesus' name, amen. The Apostle Paul gave the following instructions to the church in the city of Corinth. Now concerning the collection for the saints, as I directed the churches of Galatia, so do you also. On the first day of every week, each one of you is to put aside and save as he may prosper so that no collections be made when I come. 1 Corinthians 16 verses 1 and 2. For a congregation to carry out its necessary work, it must have operating funds. The passage we just read serves as our example for gathering Brown Trail's monetary resources. It's a simple free will offering. If you ever visit with us on a Sunday, we will collect an offering, but our guests are never obligated or pressured to give. The passing of collection trays is just an expedient way for us. If you will please join me in standing as we sing this next song before the scripture reading and sermon.
A favorite song of a lot of folks is the song titled, Heaven Will Surely Be Worth It All. It's number 223 in our, in our song books, and uh, God willing, if we make it uh, through the next few minutes, we'll sing that song to conclude our service today. It's a song that brings to mind a couple of things. One, it brings to mind the many sacrifices that Christians are often called upon to make. But it also brings to mind the splendors of eternal life that await those who so endure. And the message of the song is thoroughly biblical. Call your attention to a couple of passages that make the point of the song. Romans chapter 8 verse 18 is one of those where Paul wrote, for I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed to us. Sacrifices, the sufferings of this present time, but reward, the glory to be revealed to us. We find a similar sentiment 1 Corinthians chapter 4, 2 Corinthians actually chapter 4, verse 17, our light affliction, which is but for a moment, works for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. Again, Paul writes of affliction on the one hand, but exceeding glory on the other. That's the message of that song. Heaven will surely be worth it all, and indeed it will. But we have to hang in there. We have to stay true to God. We have to hold to His unchanging hand. And so that's what I've titled the lesson today, Hang In There. And we're going to consider this morning some of the costs as well as some of the rewards of being a Christian. Let's talk about the costs first. The price that we often have to pay here. And first of all, let's establish the fact that there is a cost to being a disciple of Jesus. It does cost us something. Sometimes it costs us a lot. But it should be no surprise to us that that's the case because Jesus told us as much. He told a parable to that end in Luke chapter 14. Specifically in verses 27 and 28, we read these words. Whoever does not bear his own cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. For which of you desiring to build a tower does not first sit down and count the cost, whether he has enough to complete it. Jesus goes on, Otherwise, when he has laid a foundation and is not able to finish, all who see it begin to mock him, saying, This man began to build and was not able to finish. Or what king, going out to encounter another king in war, will not sit down first and deliberate? whether he is able with 10,000 to meet him who comes against him with 20,000. And if not, while the other is yet a great way off, he sends a delegation and asks for terms of peace. So Jesus said, "If, if a person wants to be my disciple, he must bear his own cross. And then on the heels of that statement is when he said, you all count costs, right? Before you decide to engage in some kind of endeavor, you decide first, a wise person does anyway, decides first whether or not you have what it takes to complete the action, whatever it is. You count the cost. Well, what are some of the costs to us? Well, sometimes, well, not just sometimes, often. We have to tell ourselves no. We have to deny ourselves strong passions, strong desires that originate within ourselves. 
That's a price. That's a cost that we have to pay. We have desires. There are things that we want. And sometimes those things that we want are not good for us. And we recognize that. And so if we're wise, if we're truly a disciple of Jesus, sometimes we have to tell ourselves no. Or maybe it's a desire, and there's not anything wrong with the desire itself, but there's a temptation to fulfill that desire outside of God's will. And we have to tell ourselves no. Jesus said, if any man would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. Luke 9, verse 23. We studied recently uh, Moses in Hebrews chapter 11. And remember verse 25 said that Moses chose rather to endure mistreatment from the people than to enjoy the passing pleasures of sin. Moses understood that there was pleasure in certain sin, but it was passing, it was fleeting. And so he denied himself that fleeting pleasure. Sometimes we have to do that. That's a cost. It's a price that we pay for being a disciple of Jesus. For some people, there's the cost of family and friends. Jesus said in Matthew 10, verses 34 to 37, that there would be division in families because of him, because of Jesus. And one of the statements Jesus made in that section, Matthew 10, 34 and following, he said a a, a person's enemies will be those of his own household. Sometimes that's true. And some of you in this assembly know exactly what that's like. Because you've you've made that sacrifice. You've been forced by circumstances to pay that price of facing and enduring division within your own family or within your own group of friends because you decided that you would follow Jesus and others close to you decided they would not. It's a price that some have to pay. As a disciple of Jesus, we will face some level of embarrassment, humiliation, simply because we're disciples of Jesus. Peter in 1 Peter chapter 4 verse 14 spoke of those who are insulted for the name of Christ. It's a price we have to pay. Bless those, Jesus said, who curse you. Luke 6, verses 27 and 28. So does that mean some are going to do that? Some are going to curse us? Yes, some will. It's a price we have to pay. You see, people who don't know God are not going to understand the people who do know God. And one of the ways that people respond to things that they don't understand is ridicule. Peter, again, 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 4, wrote about that phenomenon. And he said to these Christians who had become true disciples, followers of Jesus. And because they had begun to follow Jesus, their lives changed from what they used to be. And they didn't involve themselves in the same kinds of things that they used to. And Peter wrote about that and he said that the people that you used to run around with, the people that used to be your close associates, that you... In, that you uh, you know, had paired up with and involved yourself with in things that were, that were wrong and sinful. And now you're not doing that. He said, 1 Peter 4, verse 4, they, those other people, they are surprised when you do not join them in debauchery and they malign you. Peter said, that's, how, that's what happens. 
those who don't understand what it means to be a disciple of Jesus, and they don't understand what it means to follow Jesus, and they see you following Jesus, and you're not doing the things that you used to do, they don't get it. They don't understand it. And they're surprised by your new way of living. And because they don't understand it, they choose to deal with it by trying to humiliate you. It's a price that we pay. Some people will pay the price financially. Jesus encountered a young man in Mark chapter 10 who had to face that possibility. Now, he didn't choose wisely. He chose, instead of being affected financially by following Jesus, he chose to not follow Jesus. Mark 10, verses 21 and 22, Jesus encountered this young man, and he said in the course of that conversation, there's one thing you lack. Go and sell what you have and give to the poor. And the man went away grieving because he had many possessions. The implication was, and obviously by his actions, he was unwilling to give any of them up to follow Jesus. Those possessions actually possessed him. They had a hold of his heart. And he didn't have room for Jesus to get hold of his heart. But those that are willing to follow Jesus, sometimes they will pay a financial price for doing that. will also be called upon at times to carry the burden of disappointment in those around us. Apathy, neglect, bitterness, compromise. We'll see those things a lot of times in the people around us, Christians I'm talking about. And it'll disappoint us, and we'll carry around that burden of disappointment when we don't see people that should be following Jesus because they made that commitment and they're not. And then add to that the burden that we all carry around of our own personal weaknesses. The burden we carry of consistent failure. as we wrestle against the powers of evil. Paul wrote about that wrestling match in Ephesians 6, 10 and following as as he gets into that section on the armor of the Christian. And he said, you know, we, we don't wrestle against flesh and blood. We wrestle against principalities, powers, rulers of this present darkness, <clears throat> spiritual hosts of wickedness in heavenly places. Our battle's not against flesh and blood. It's against evil. And oftentimes in that wrestling match, we lose. We lose some of those individual battles, and that burdens us. At least it should. Paul said, I... I I buffet my body daily, 1 Corinthians 9, 27. Buffet, the the idea of discipline. He said, I have to bring my, my own self into subjection because I don't want to be cast off after I've preached to others. That's a burden that we carry. So we we carry all of those things around. Those are the costs. Those are some of the costs of being a disciple of Jesus. And the song that we are going to sing in a bit uses language that highlights that suffering. It uses language like hindered. Often I'm hindered on my way. Burdened. So heavy I almost fall. It uses language like trials and toils and tears and many a heartache. Yes, discipleship is costly. And as we live from day to day trying our best to do good, all of that doing of good can weary a person. 
Hence the warning of Galatians 6 verse 9. Do not grow weary in doing good. Well, there's evidently the, the possibility that we could do exactly that. And sometimes we do grow weary. And Satan is going to seize that opportunity and tempt us to give up in our weariness. So those are some of the costs that, that we face here. Now let's turn our attention to the rewards there. The rewards there. <clears throat> and I want to call your attention to the apostles for just a moment. Because we're going to draw on the words of some of the apostles, Peter and uh, Paul and John specifically, in just a moment. But I want to set this up first to remind us of what the apostles themselves endured. And to do that, 1 Corinthians chapter 4, beginning in verse 9, we read these words. 1 Corinthians 4, beginning in 9. For I think that God has exhibited us apostles as last of all, like men sentenced to death, because we have become a spectacle to the world, to angels, and to men. We are fools for Christ's sake, but you are wise in Christ. I believe, incidentally, I believe Paul, Paul is using some irony here. Uh, he's, he's, he's talking about what he's enduring and then contrasting that with, with the Corinthians' own faulty view of themselves, all right? So we're fools for Christ's sake, but you're wise, you see. We are weak, but you're strong. You're held in honor, but we in disrepute. To the present hour, we hunger and thirst we're poorly dressed and buffeted and homeless. And we labor, working with our hands. When reviled, we bless. When persecuted, we endure. When slandered, we entreat. We have become and are still like the scum of the world, the refuse of all things. Let that language settle into your mind for a moment. This is how Paul described, not just himself, but the apostles generally. You see that in verse 9? God has exhibited us apostles. Last of all, like those sentenced to death, we've become a spectacle to everybody, considered to be fools, weak, We hunger and thirst. We deal with all of these physical difficulties. We're paying a physical price. And he said, we are like the scum of the earth. But, even though all of that was true, I want you to hear the words written by these same apostles that Paul said were treated like the scum of the earth. Even though all of that was true, those apostles looked forward to great reward. And the certainty of those promises of reward lifted their spirits. And drove them to keep living for Jesus. For example, the Apostle Paul said he was looking forward to, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 1, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. Even if the earthly house of this tabernacle, I think he's speak, speaking of the body, the physical body, even though the earthly house of this tabernacle be dissolved, we still have a building of God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. In this we groan, longing to be clothed with that new body. He looked forward to a glorious transformation from this corruptible body to an incorruptible one. 
like the resurrection body of Jesus. Philippians 3, verses 20 and 21, our citizenship is in heaven from which we wait for a Savior who will fashion our lowly body, the body of our humiliation, to be like His glorious body. That's what Paul looked forward to. Yes, treated like the scum of the earth here. Yes, paying a physical price. But the reward will be worth it all. He looked forward to a crown of righteousness to be given him by the Lord himself, 2 Timothy 4, verse 8. He looked forward to a happy reunion with Jesus, and so shall we ever be with the Lord, 1 Thessalonians 4, 17. These same apostles who were treated so poorly looked forward to an inheritance, incorruptible, undefiled, that fades not away, reserved in heaven for you. Peter wrote that, 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 4. Peter would later use the language in 2 Peter chapter 3, verses 13 and 14, of looking forward to a new heavens and new earth where righteousness dwells. John would use the same language, Revelation 21, verse 1. These apostles looked forward to John's writings, the holy city, new Jerusalem coming down out of heaven from God. And looked forward to that time when the announcement is made, the dwelling place of God is with men, and he'll wipe away every tear from their eyes. Revelation 21, verses 1 to 4. You see, those are all words from these same apostles who said, yeah, we're treated like the scum of the earth. But here's what we look forward to. Here's the reward. And that's what gets most of our attention. And that keeps us from giving in to the pressures that come our way. You see, when we consider and, and focus our minds on the costs of discipleship without also considering the rewards of discipleship, we're going to find it very difficult to be steadfast and unmovable and always abounding in the work of the Lord. 1 Corinthians 15, 58. And so, yes, we have to endure things. Yes, there's a price to be paid for being a disciple of Jesus, but heaven will surely be worth it all. Is there really a comparison between a few years of difficulty here and I don't want to minimize the difficulty here. Even if the difficulties we face are severe, even if they are faith-assaulting difficulties, even if it's physical disease, whatever it is, still, is there even a comparison? between the difficulties here and an eternity of delight and rest in the presence of God. What if Paul or Peter or John could return to us and speak to us today? What if our loved ones who have died in Christ could speak to us today? Wouldn't they all with one voice say to us, it's worth it. It's worth it. Whatever you have to endure here, whatever ridicule, whatever physical, financial, whatever, it doesn't matter. Whatever it is that you have to endure here, it's worth it. Because we've now come to experience what's on the other side. And so the word of encouragement for us 
We'll borrow from Hebrews chapter 10, verses 35 and 36. Therefore, <clears throat> do not throw away your confidence, which has great reward. For you have need of endurance, so that when you have done the will of God, you may receive what's promised. will boil those two verses down to three words. Hang in there. Let's pray. Gracious Father in heaven, we thank you so much for the blessing of knowing that there is a reward waiting for us. We're thankful that it's an inheritance, incorruptible, undefiled, that fades not away, reserved in heaven for us. And we're thankful that we have it to look forward to, and we're thankful for the motivation that it gives us to endure whatever we have to endure in this life. And it's our prayer that we will hold always to your unchanging hand and trust in your strength, trust in your presence to walk with us through the valleys that we have to walk through here. And we pray that we would not ever under any circumstances grow weary in well-doing. And we pray that you would help us always to remember that in due season we will reap if we do not faint. And we thank you for Jesus who makes that hope possible and in whose name we pray. Amen. I used an example in a sermon a few weeks ago that is attributed, at least it's, it's, a, it's a statement attributed more often than not or more often to this person than anybody else was attributed to Lord Wellington after his defeat, after he defeated Napoleon. And they were asking him about his army and he said, you know, my men were not braver than his. They were just braver five minutes longer. That may have to be true of us. We may not have any more courage than the next person. We just may need to have courage just a little bit longer. Hang in there. In due season, we'll reap if we hang in there. There may be someone in the assembly today who needs the prayers of your Christian family to hang in there or for some other reason. If we may pray with you and for you today, we invite you to let us know what your need is. There may be someone in the assembly who's not a Christian, but you've studied the Word of God and you understand what you need to do and you are ready to make that commitment to be a disciple, a true disciple of Jesus, regardless of what it may cost you. If you're willing to make that commitment and you counted the cost, We'll help you to complete your obedience to the gospel. Let us stand and sing.
Please be seated. Responding this morning uh, to request our prayers is Brother Bob Ritchie, and um, Brother Bob has visited with us quite a bit over the, the last few years. Uh, he uh, is a member at the College Hill uh, congregation, and, um, and yet, like I said, he's visited with us quite a bit, and I know many of you know him. And uh, he comes just to request our prayers today because of just a heavy burden that he is carrying with him. And um, Bob, for a long, long time, uh, gave uh, the best of care to his wife, Beth, who suffered for a long time with cancer. And she passed away last October. And uh, since that time, uh, Bob has been trying to deal with that loss, and um, I don't I don't have the experience to know what that's like, but I know some of you in this assembly do, and so you know you know what that hurt is like, and Bob has been dealing with that, and and uh, it's 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 just a burden that sometimes people feel like it's more than they can than they can bear. And, um, and Bob just kind of feels that keenly this morning and felt comfortable enough to come and to ask us to pray with him about that and about this burden uh, of just life. And he, you know, of course, he says he has a, a good support from family. His grandson is here today and, and uh, support from others. But still, it's hard. It's hard. And he wanted us to pray with him and for him today. And we want to honor his request. Kevin Carroll, of course, is here. He's one of our elders. We'll ask him to come and pray uh, with Bob. Would you pray with me? Our Father in heaven, we now come before you and... Uh, uh, just express our gratitude that you do allow us to come before your throne and bring our thoughts and our cares to you. 
Right now, we want to pray on behalf of uh, Bob Ritchie um, in his sorrow and, and grieving over his beloved wife. And um, we know that that can be such a, a, a painful experience to go through, to be separated from someone that you have uh, loved deeply for so many years and been such a part of, of your life. And that is a, a very heavy burden to bear and a very great um, uh, parting and separation. And we pray that those of us and those of his family can be able to reach out and help and support and encourage that no one should have to walk that path alone. And though it will never be easy, it can be eased with those of like-minded faith to wrap their arms around him and hug him and encourage him through, knowing that some great day there will be a reunion again. And we're grateful that we can have hope in that day and we can look forward to that where we can be reunited with loved ones again. And we're so grateful for Jesus Christ that allows us to have that hope. And we thank you for this and we ask again that Bob would receive peace from you, the peace that passes understanding, um, knowing that there will be that reunion someday. In Jesus' name, amen. Good morning. It's good to see everyone, uh, see new faces as, as well as some old faces that haven't been able to be around for a while. We're glad to see everybody here. Um, we have a few announcements, and uh, so if you'll bear with me just a minute, a few uh, updates to our uh, sick list and such. We extend our sympathy to the family of our dear brother, Howard Ross, who passed away August 23rd just days shy of his 98th birthday. Uh, the funeral will be uh, Thursday, September 3rd at 1 p.m. here at the Brown Trail Building. Uh, the burial will follow at 2.30 at the DFW National Cemetery. Uh, Harold Floyd remains in Harris Methodist Hospital in Fort Worth after suffering a stroke last Sunday. He is showing signs of improvement. Tom Mack's neck surgery went well, and he's recovering at home. Jim Wilcox is ill at home with COVID-19. Uh, we got uh, a message this morning uh, from uh, Cindy Gossett that says, Emily Gossett is having foot surgery tomorrow morning. Uh, so let's please be sure to, to pray for, uh, for that surgery to go well. Um, we also uh, were made aware that Taylor Ferris's parents were uh, impacted by the hurricane uh, that came through Louisiana, uh, and they will be without power for a month. Um, and there's also several church members that lost their homes uh, involved in that storm. So let's be sure to pray for all of those that were affected. We do offer congratulations to David and Suzanne Barker on the birth of their first grandchild, Obadiah Thomas Barker, who was born August 20th to Gerald, Jared and Cecily Barker. He was seven pounds, eight ounces, and 20 and a half inches long. And as many of you know, David and Suzanne, this child is in grave danger of being loved to death. So <laughs> please pray for this child, I just and Jared and Cecily as well. Uh, the, there will be a wedding shower for Shelby Whalen, bride-elect of Nick Hentz, on September 13th from 2 to 3.30 in the home of Cheryl Selby. 
A shower table has been also been set up in the foyer. Gifts can be placed there and they will be delivered to the shower. Uh, and registries are at Crate and Barrel, Amazon, and Target. And finally, as mentioned last week, um, beginning September 9th, we will resume our weekly 7 p.m. Wednesday night assemblies. There will be no classes. We will all meet in the auditorium. Thank you. The funeral uh, is on Thursday, September 3rd. So this coming Thursday, and that's at 1 p.m. And the typical social distancing will apply as well. Obadiah Barker. That's quite a name. Congratulations. If, uh, if it's convenient, would you please stand with me as we sing our closing song? Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for your son Jesus that paid the price for our sins and washed away our sins. Uh, we thank you so much for all the many blessings of life and all the forms you give us each and every day. Please be with those uh, stricken by the hurricane and please be comfort Brother Bob and please help those who are sick and lost loved ones. We know that heaven will surely be worth it all and please guide our path towards that goal. Be with us as we go through this week and, and watch over us and keep us safe and guide us in your path. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. <laughs>